Essential magic. How much do you care now about true magic? Not your Barneses and Nobles bookshelf magic, but true ethereal magic. Now I'm not trying to degrade the modern practice. It does hold to the standard of systematic process and methodology that is essential for the use of complex spellcraft. What's worse than a bookworm who thinks they know magic from store-bought collections is someone who actually knows real mystical spells but doesn't have the skill and learned patience of how to properly perform the aspects involved in actual ritual magic and conjuring incantations. But even the most learned acolyte can levitate and still know nothing of the true craft if he has not the discipline. I will be your defense against the dark arts teacher this semester Professor Lucifer. No worries about me falling to the control of Voldemort because I know just about every possible Voldemort there is or ever could be so on to our lessons of Magic 101. Well here is some historical knowledge. As I have said before about the astral anti and ancient migrational cultures of what we now call Native Americans and Mayans, Naga Thule as well as the Indus tribes were all once one people, the younger Dryas, by archaeological accounts. They foresaw the coming of a great worldwide disaster. They split into seven tribes each traveling along different migrational tracks. One tribe went into the northeast and traveled across the Alaskan mountains into North America. Another, the Mayan and Werther tribe, 
Kuna Princess buried beneath the Sphinx known as Inanna due to erosion and damage but her name was actually Aeliana and her epitaph can be found still partially intact in the Nag Hammurabi called the Holy Book of the Great Invisible Spirit, traveled south into Africa and into the Antarctic region for a time then traveled northward into the South American regions. One tribe traveled northwest into the marshlands of what was England at the time and Scandinavia then traveled overseas to Greenland and then the eastern coastline of the North American region. Another tribe traveled into the desert lands of Egypt and Mesopotamia and ruled over the early Egyptians as their primordial gods. Then they traveled further southeast and became the Naga Thule and through sorcery and deception of illusions did the people living around them believe them to be serpent men of the Naga legends of India. Now this knowledge is not widely available, nevertheless this early culture was much more advanced than the others. Over thousands of years of evolution their physical structure has changed but they were once the mythical race we know as elves. One trait that they all still share is their empathic connection to the earth and the animals of the forest. These people have an innate sense of understanding of magic energy they call mana pools. In modern terminology it is scientifically broken down like this. The center of the earth has its own gravitational waves that resonate from the core of the mantle outward into the crust. When the gravitational waves pass through the sediment crust the waves transform into a low frequency sound wave due to its interaction with the iron ore and nickel deposits within the crust. As the waves reach closer to the surface they begin to compress and merge with one another and fuse into concentrated lines of vibrational kinetic energy. This kinetic energy are like veins within the planet flowing in a continuous stream. This culture of elves or whatever you want to call them were the first to believe that the planet itself was a living entity and revered it. Now in certain areas around the planet those energy streams breach the surface and the elves would build their sacred cities on top of these surface streams thus calling them mana pools. It is said in the occult communities that these ancient elven cities still exist hidden from the world by their ancient magic. Last that was known all about them they were occupied by the fairy, whose magic is still very strong into the present day. Though revered in India as a Hindu gods as I remember it and have experienced myself fairies and their magic are incessantly annoying and they themselves are a mischievous bunch, like little gremlins with wings. They constantly will cast magic to cause you to lose focus of what you're doing especially when trying to write about them. Luckily I have cast a spell that allows me to stay focused while I'm writing. Little bastards. Their cities can be found along the ley line breaches in remote areas but they are veiled by ancient sorcery. If you have a spell that allows you to reveal that which is hidden, or to see that which cannot be seen such as the Eye of Horus Enlightenment Hymn or the Light of the All-Seeing Eye Incantation known to the Occult Order of the Illuminati then you should be capable of detecting the traces to these cities out of boundaries. I feel myself becoming clouded and my words are not coming out right which means the fairy magic has found a way around my spell so I shall stop the for now on that subject. Generations born in these cities would become imbued with the life streams kinetic energy and shamans would be born. These men had a natural ability to control and connect with certain elements of the earth and had strong empathic connections to the forests, trees, oceans, animals everything. There were women born into this way too but mainly as nursery maidens to help raise and care for the children when the parents were busy. This is the source and origin of what we call those with extrasensory perception and kinetic abilities. This gave rise eventually to the very earliest of magic use. However sorcery and sage magic draw their power from two different sources. The sages draw their power from the earth. Sorcerers draw their power from the universe itself. We are born saturated by the energy of the cosmos during planetary alignments and cosmic events. This is the reason why astrological charts and constellations were originally recorded and applied apart from seasonal forecasting and their search for evidence of stellar events that could mark the coming of disasters on Earth. They knew the energy fields of gravitational wave transference involving the larger planets like Saturn and Jupiter could cause direct weather anomalies, volcanic activity and earthquakes. 
They also knew that bearing a child on specific days that were marked as solstices and equinoxes that aligned during planetary alignments would perform a similar effect as that of the shaman of the astral Antilles, since it was their culture who had imparted this wisdom upon the Egyptians and other cultures in the first place. These cosmic shaman, or sorcerers, held power over the stellar universe that they called arcana magic or chaos magic. Yet unlike the shaman, a sorcerer's power was limited and had to be recharged. The energy which they derived this magic from came from the cosmos so they were not constantly saturated by it as shamans were. Each cycle in which they were born under had to be met by the sorcerer that would perform a ritual that would draw upon the cosmic energy they were saturated or infused with and re-energize themselves and their magical ability. A sorcerer who is well energized each cycle without interference can not only live to be very old but transcend from one form to another avoiding death for very long periods of time. Chronos or Father Time is rumored to have originated from a time before the deluge and may still exist today. Thoth had stated that he had descended into death and returned thousands of times as his origins may go back close to 158 million years. Even the origin of the Age of Magic is said to have possibly started around 220 million years ago and then ended only about 75,000 years ago at the end of the Younger Dryas period. Every sorcerer draws their power from this source in one way or another. I am giving you the raw original truth to our powers sources was the way of my ancestors back then. We were not as possessive with our craft as the Astlantines were. We believed that ignorance gives way to unintentional acts of destruction and therefore uncontrollable events of catastrophe. So we mostly wanted all to know of its basic principles so that they would know its fundamental laws and maintain its balance if the random chance presented itself. Over time other cultures have adapted different ways of extracting and filtering the sages' mana pools raw energy. Such as the Templars who built temples and great churches with mysterious architecture and designs within the church. These Masonic temples were built where the life streams mana pools breached the surface which they called ley lines and the architectural structure directed the kinetic flow through the calculated designs manipulating and filtering its effects. When we cast our spells we duplicate the earth's life stream process that dictates and molds the elemental forces. So too does it go for sorcery as we tamper and imbue the fundamental forces of the universe. My ancestors' arcana spells have been rumored to be powerful enough to create entire alternate pocket universes such as the one that contains the Dark One or the Demi-Urge or Domad and Uxamidinian by the Nag Hammurabi translation. Though it is evident in the universe's patchwork I've noticed traces that the Creator, or God, may be of our lineage as well I do not think he has been born yet. The other evidence within the design of all things show traces of other aspects like quantum field perspectives but an advanced form from the modern science theories. Also I've noticed traces of computer program design patterns but its pattern is an advanced algorithm much more advanced than our current system of binary ones and zeros. Just the dimensional field perspectives of 6th and 7th dimensional based beings show the possibility of a 12-digit binary code that must be most likely an ASI quantum supercomputer, something far more advanced than anything in current production here on Earth. Anyway back on topic. The spell resonates from within us where our life force has been infused with the cosmic energy. Within us lies the raw spark of the cosmos that can resonate and therefore command any aspect within it through matching its resonating density to that which we want to command. With the frequencies of the elements density and resonating vibrational pattern that we cast within the spell. That frequency filters through us surfacing in certain points where the spell's energy is transformed into a vibrational pattern as we speak the words of the spell fusing our mental intention of the spell's effects with the frequency of the spell's elemental resonance pattern through vocal vibrations, then merging the two through the vibration of our voice and then casting that fused energy in the direction of the object or person we are aiming for by bridging a connection like a circuit board in a computer. This is the fundamental process of true magic. 
It may take years for a student to master this ability precisely and achieve the correct skill to cast their first spell successfully. It depends on the student's ability to grasp the full concept and adapt its skill. Which as you can now tell is an advanced form of the modern science we use today yet known by ancestors of our distant past. A knowledge long lost and forgotten by the world of today. Long before mankind existed, the old ones trod upon the earth. They worshipped the elder gods and served them as slaves. But in time, the old ones gained the knowledge of dark magic and dared to use their sinister powers against their masters. The wrath of the elder gods was merciless and terrible, and those who rebelled against them were banished to distant dimensions and imprisoned deep within the darkest recesses of the earth. In deathless sleep, the old ones dream and lie and wait for the time when they shall rise again. For when the stars come right, they shall awaken from their eon old slumber. Then shall they return to hold dominion over our world once more, bringing woe and destruction unto mankind.